Hello, welcome back to the afternoon session of this year's conference. We are so grateful unto you all for staying with us right from the morning session down to the afternoon. We welcome you back to this session. To begin the afternoon session, we are going to talk about the role of school leadership in the new normal as far as blended learning or virtual learning is concerned. To help us with this session is a retired senior research fellow of the American Institute of Research, who is currently the president of the K-16 Educational Consult, LLC. She has over 40 years of experience in this conversation of blended learning. She currently holds a doctorate degree from the University of Pittsburgh and a master's in education from the American University. She also has a certificate in blended learning and so we are rest assured that this lady or this woman is the best person to go to as far as this session is concerned. She is already smiling and excited to take the session. Help me, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Gwendolyn Willis Dapo. Hi, Dr. Gwen. Hi there, how are you? I'm doing very well. It's good to see you. It's good to be seen. Great, great. I believe you are ready for the session. Yes, I'm ready. So I'm going to take myself off video and share my screen if I can. Fantastic. That's, that's okay. So we're taking a look at station rotation in action. Yes, nice stuff. So the impact of differentiation, the students feel successful. They feel supported. They know if something is difficult for them, there's something that's a little more in line with their strengths coming up soon. So it really makes education fun and approachable. I really think it's the most effective way that I have seen. The vision and the mission of Planning Earth is to use innovative practice as a social catalyst. We want our kids to be able to do anything any other kid from Providence could do. We use differentiation all across the curriculum here at Highlander and especially in the first grade. Although the content is the same, having the stations really allows me to tailor my lessons to each individual group of learners. So how the differentiation looks in my classroom, we start off with a whole group lesson. So let's get our reading glasses on. Let's get the letter part of our brains activated. This section of our curriculum, we have been looking at nonfiction texts. When we're looking at our book today, we're going to be thinking about where we can get information. And then in the phonics realm, we focused on contractions. We're taking two words, and what are we sticking them together with? A positive be yes, Karen. And then we break off into our small groups. So our yellow group is still learning how to do a lot of our literacy things. The green group is doing pretty well, but has a few things to work on still. And our blue group is hitting all the first grade standards and needs to be stretched. So our differentiation kind of takes two forms. The first is by student grouping, and the second is by modality. We have 20 minutes per station, and there are three of the stations. The students will rotate through all three stations each day. So our first station for the group group is the computer station. The students use a Google form to check in. They'll normally watch a video or carefully observe a photograph and answer some questions about that. We watch a video about how to grow a seed. We had to type in our favorite part and why. After they finish that form, they can check out an ebook. And then you could do this game of reading called Teacher Master How to Read. We're delivering things in a way that is visual, that is auditory, that is individual to the students through the technology. After that, she rings the bell. Clean up, switch up, first grade readers. We switch to the sort station. Our sort station is more of a physical modality. They're using their bodies, which is so important for first graders. They need to move. 
Kids are cutting out the words, they're gluing them down. We have contrasting games. It's fun because it's all mixed up and you had to find the right pieces. And then after we do that, we do rainbow writing. That's another way that we differentiate. If students are able to get through more work, then they have some freedom of choice. Now switch it up. Yeah. The last station, we're talking to each other and learning from each other. So that's more of the social interaction type of thing. I like the teacher station because we get to be with Ms. Gallagher and we get to learn from stuff. So take a look at the illustrations on this page. The content is the same, but it can be differentiated in the number of ways. My blue group, for example, they know what text is. They know what illustrations are. And so for them, I created that diagram. You need to make one circle like this, and then you make another circle overlapping. Oh! For the yellow or the green group, I'm just leaving the Venn diagram out of it. We're still doing essentially the same thing, but just that piece that might be confusing to some of those students, I just leave that out for a later time. They'll get to it. All right, so clean up and meet me in the middle of the rug for writing. Nice work, first grade. Being able to move through those stations, it's just another level of helping the students learn as much as they can each year. They really feel excited when they make that growth. They're proud of themselves. They feel like they're effective learners. As a teacher, honestly, it is a lot of work, but the results that you see and the happy faces of the kids and the good feeling that you have in the classroom is worth it. Okay, that's a great example of station rotation in action. So study this illustration and notice that there are three groups of students and each group rotates to each station for 30 minutes. In this model, time management is extremely important when implementing station rotation. And as you can see, students are grouped according to skill level. Every student rotates to each station and equal time slots are assigned for each station. I'm gonna move quickly because we lost some time. The next one is lab rotation, and it's very popular as well. It's like station rotation, except one station is dedicated to online in a computer lab. Again, it's student-centered, you can differentiate instruction, and it easily accommodates special needs students. This diagram illustrates the configuration of a lab rotation. Students participate in direct instruction that culminates in computer lab activities that reinforce classroom content. The individual rotation model is another popular blended learning model. As you can see, while the characteristics of the various models differ, the benefits remain essentially the same. So the rotation schedule is determined by a teacher or algorithm Students do not rotate to every station. They only rotate to stations on their individual schedule or playlist. It's student-centered, but it enables the teacher to use class time for more than just delivering content. There's an opportunity for differentiation and individualized instruction for students who have special needs. This illustration on the left represents one possible setup for the individual rotation featuring a collaborative space along with other opportunities for direct instruction, intervention and remediation, as well as a small group seminar. On the right hand side, you see an illustration of a smartphone where the playlist is um, listed and individual instructional tasks are assigned to a specific student that allows rotation to the stations that are listed on the play card. So it's a little different than station rotation. The flipped classroom is another popular model for use, particularly at the high school level, but it is showing up at the elementary level as well. This model flips the traditional relationship between class time and homework. 
students learn at home via some online coursework and lectures, but the class time is used for teacher guided practice and projects. It's learner centered. Once again, it enables teachers to use class time for more than delivering traditional lectures. And there's an opportunity for individualized differentiated instruction, again, for students who have special needs. So this video shows the flip model in action at Clintondale High School. In Clintondale was low performing, but now it's one of the top 50 blended learning high schools in the United States. Let's take a look. So you see how they're in the same thing? What if you took the traditional school day and flipped it on its head? Not literally, of course, but having lessons offered at night at home and homework done by day in the classroom. That's the experiment underway at Clintondale High School, just outside Detroit, an area still reeling from the economic and social ills of the nearby city. The school serves many low-income families and faces tight budgets and declining enrollment. So what's the number one? Just three years ago, almost half of Clintondale's ninth graders were failing math, science, and English. And overall school performance was ranked in the lowest 5% in Michigan. Yeah. Principal Greg Green decided to take a risk. Frankly, we weren't doing very well. And so you know, we had to make a change. I mean, we're we're desperate for change. His aha moment came while coaching his 11-year-old son's baseball team. Having learned to record and post instructional videos for his players to watch outside of practice, he was struck by how much time was then left to focus on individual players on the field. He saw the educational potential starting with the power of videos. Just go back and watch them as many times as they want. And, and then me as a as an instructor or expert, I don't have to redo that all the time. I can spend my time with, with the students in the class and actually assisting them. And so if I could do that with 11 year olds, imagine what we could do with 15 or 16 year olds doing math. Green went all in, flipping the entire school, urging his staff to rethink the use of technology and how it complements traditional teaching and getting local businesses to help fund the effort. Well, the legislative branch makes a lot. Now, lectures are recorded and posted online. The American Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865, where teachers can assign outside videos from the popular Khan Academy and TED Talks. Students watch these videos as homework outside of class. Why do you say it's Smithsonian? In class, students now do what was once considered homework. Assignments designed to test learning comprehension. Lindendale so teachers say this allows more time for one-on-one -on -one help and often encourages students to collaborate in problem solving. But English teacher Rob Damron said it took some convincing. When we first did this, it was funny to look around that staff meeting and look at a lot of staff members, you know, especially the ones that have been here 25, 30 years. And say, what, what are you talking about? What's a blog? You know, what's a Google group? Apostrophes makes a noun show ownership or possession. For teaching for 20 years, I know what lessons kids are going to have a, a problem with. But I think with doing this flipped approach, there's problems I didn't even know existed. So you really can't hide back there in the corner and say, yeah, I got it. You know, and then the teacher sees later on, well, no, he really didn't get it. One problem the school faced head on students who can't afford or don't have access to technology outside of class. They're given extra time in the school's media lab. Segregation before 1954. Taking the technology-driven approach further, some lesson plans are now tailored to have students use the latest trends in social media. Thanks to the 19th Amendment, us women have the right to vote. We deserve to vote. We deserve to vote. Like this project that required constitutional amendments, to be summed up in six seconds for the popular website Vine. Green says that taken all together, after three years, the flip is paying off. Now, our ACT games have, have shown you know, doubling the national average as far as ACT games. Now, state testing, we've had some mixed results on that. And we've also seen an increase in graduation rates at almost 90%, college acceptance rates at 80%. Senior Darrell Wallace Jr. is one example. 
His grades have risen from a 2.5 GPA as a freshman to 3.5 as a senior. And he says the flip has played a big role. He now watches videos on his cell phone while taking the bus home into a rough section of Detroit where he lives with his mother and four sisters. I really look at the videos more because I know I might not have as much time at home because my sisters are in college and they need a computer so much. I can do it on my phone. And the first one has like 30 minutes, so probably get like half of my son done. Daryl's mother, Sabrina Young, also likes the flipped model, saying there's only so much she can do to help with traditional homework. Since the algebra, um, him doing it at school is a plus for him, yeah, as well as me, because I just didn't remember the majority of it. The popularity of online learning has surged in recent years. Flipped classrooms have started popping up everywhere, from elementary schools to some of the nation's top universities. Lindendale is the first U.S. high school to do a total flip. Harvard's Justin Wright has been studying the trend and says he's cautiously optimistic. What is exciting to me about the flipped classroom is that it gets teachers asking two really important fundamental questions. What are the best ways for me to use my time, especially the very precious time I have in classrooms with my students? And then, what are the kinds of direct instruction that I could provide that could be digitized so that people could watch it again? Well, notice that the last set of notes I gave you were for week five. But Wright says that flipping alone isn't enough. As with any lesson plan, it all depends on exactly what's being offered. If what we see from the flipped classroom is that we take um, bad lectures and uninteresting worksheet problems that characterize a lot of the experience that students have in schools, and we simply flip the order of those two things, the odds that we see significant improvement in our schools is pretty low. And so now we're going to be taking derivative with respect to date. Meanwhile, some individual teachers are experimenting with the flipped classroom on their own. Three years ago, Stacy Roshan flipped her up for level math classroom at the private Bullis High School outside of Washington, D.C., where students pay up to $35,000 a year in tuition. She says it's been working for her, but that it might not be for everyone. I think what's the most important thing is that you really think through what your problem is. Um, I wouldn't say that because everybody's doing a book classroom, it's cool you should do the book classroom too. My problem is really time, anxiety, and perhaps if I went to another school, I would do things completely differently. One added surprise for Roshan in structuring her class this way is what she learned about the reach of her online lessons. I get thank you letters from students all the time, um, not even just from the US, but overseas too, and I, it, that part always amazes me. Back at Clintondale, Principal Greg Reeking's big experiment is getting a lot of attention. More than 200 educators from around the world have visited the school, trying to draw lessons from the flipped classroom. So that's a great example of the flipped classroom, and it's, in, it's being uh, implemented quite a bit across the country. I'm going to skip through a la carte because that's just something that most schools do not use in the interest of time. But students have an opportunity to choose from a list of courses rather than um, go through a, an entire course curriculum. It's sort of set up like a restaurant uh, menu where the appetizers represent warm-up exercises to prepare for learning. The entrees represent primary content, and the desserts are fun reinforcement activities such as games and puzzles and things like that. Um, the flex model is a very flexible for students and teachers. It's a fluid schedule. Uh, students participate in activities according to their needs. The online learning is the backbone of this model, and students work through course curriculum in this model. It's uh, student-centered. It provides an opportunity for teachers to provide support in instruction, and it gives students a high degree of control over their learning. I have a video that, um, that illustrates this model. Uh, because we lost time, I'm going to skip that video, but I can provide the link so that you can watch it on your own. 
The final model is Enriched Virtual. It's an alternative to full-time online school. It's only recommended for highly motivated independent students who can manage their time effectively and who require little supervision. It doesn't require uh, full-time attendance at school and uh, they only attend school for required face-to-face -face sessions with teachers. It's flexible, it's student-centered, but it maintains the face-to-face school-student-teacher connection. So now I wanna to get to the meat of what I wanna talk about today, and that is the role of leadership. Now, the role of leadership may not always be obvious, but in short, the role of the leader is to lead. Having said that, I would argue that the role of the leader is to see beyond what is, plan for what if, like this COVID pandemic, and envision what can be, like remote learning. The leader should be able to see the big picture and strategically guide the organization to meet its short and long-term goals. One way a leader can see the big picture is to conduct a SWOT. An educational SWOT analysis is the way of understanding the strengths and weaknesses of your school or your district, the opportunities that might be available, and the threats that you may face. You can use your SWOT analysis to identify the critical issues for your school, such as threats and weaknesses, and to explore strategies for improvement. Now, to conduct this activity, it's relatively simple. Just take a piece of paper, fold it into four quadrants. And if you have a piece of paper, you can do this now. And you're gonna label each quadrant strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Now, as I review each component of the SWOT, I want you to think about your own school district, your own school system, your school or your classroom, and record your observations with regard to each one of the categories. So in educational SWOT analysis, you're going to identify the strengths, what's going right for your school, and the weaknesses, what's holding the school back. Now, with regard to some of the strengths, they might be things like you have highly trained teachers, or you have lots of funding and financial backing, or you have great facilities and great parental and student engagement. Weaknesses, on the other hand, are things that are holding you back, like lack of funding. You don't have insufficient, you have insufficient hardware and software. You don't have enough trained staff or faculty. You don't have um, great communication and your testing scores are not very good. When we talk about opportunities, we're talking about the positive changes that can be made in the school. And when we're talking about threats, we're talking about unaddressed issues that may lead to complications for your educational program. So what we know is that opportunities are created through weaknesses and threats. And the threats to your school or your district may be poor planning of curriculum activities. You don't have enough internal or external communications. You have poor facilities and maintenance, and you have a lack of qualified teachers. So when you conduct a SWOT analysis, you look at those things. So I would encourage you that when you get back to your schools, you do a SWOT for your school and for your classroom so that you can identify those critical issues that can push you forward or that can hold you back. I think a SWOT is critical and it's a way for the leadership to see the big picture. Now, when it comes to leadership, there are several questions that should be considered by every educational leader. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just a place to begin with capacity building and sustainability, the focus. And when you look at these questions, you can perform a SWOT for each one of them. You should make sure that you collect baseline data for each one of these questions to determine the rate of growth and improvement for strategic planning purposes. And let me just say one thing about blended learning. 
I would caution that blended learning should be implemented in one class or subject and then build out your capacity as you move forward. So let's take a look at some of these questions. Learning resources. What content and resources are already available for blended learning and how can they be integrated into the curriculum? Teacher preparation. What kind of training and support do teachers need in the instructional use of technology in the blended format? Student engagement. How do we maintain student engagement in a learning environment that is blended? Parental engagement. Why is it important? And how can we best support parents to engage with teachers and students? Assessment. This is a big one. How will we know if blended learning is effective and how should any learning gaps be addressed? And you're gonna face learning gaps because all students do not learn the same way at the same time. Data infrastructure. What investments in terms of hardware and software should be made to ensure broader access to digital resources and the interoperability of data? And finally, one that most people don't think about, but should. What community partners can be enlisted to invest in the educational future of a nation and how can they be enlisted? So let's talk about the resources first. Um, the World Bank's EdTech team has come up with a list of uh, free resources that you can use to supplement your curriculum. And if I can just get out of my screen for a second, I want to show you that list. Oh, I lost my list. Well, that's okay. Let me go back. I can get it this way. Okay, if you, if you go to their site, you're going to see the download right here. You're gonna download this official PDF. Once you download that, you're gonna see the list of the educational resources. And some of these resources you're already using like Khan Academy resources. But as you notice, they're categorized by the name, the description, the connectivity type, the subjects, the format, whether or not there's a mobile app, conditions of use, uh, language, target group, and then the link to the resource. And so there are lots of resources and they are also listed by country. So this is a good resource to have because it's free and it can help you supplement your instruction. Okay, the next group of resources are crowdsourced materials and tools in education. Again, they're free, they're crowdsourced, things like YouTube, TED Talks, and uh, uh, resources of that nation. And once you find all the resources that you want to use, the biggest job that you're going to have is classifying and categorizing these existing resources because you want to be able to access them easily. And some crowdsourced uh, resources are crowd intelligence, crowdfunding, crowd polling, crowd chat, crowdsourced schools, and crowdsourced teaching. So you can investigate those a little further, but they're definitely something that you want to look into. With regard to teacher preparation, buy-in of the teacher group is the most critical component of teacher preparation. And I might add to that, that leadership should also be trained as well. Now, teacher training should build computer and digital literacy through application. So that means that any professional development should be job embedded, it should be ongoing, and it should be blended. The integration of technology and digital tools into the classroom is something else that teachers need to be trained about. They need to be trained with regard to classroom management and time management. It's also advisable for your teaching staff to belong to PLCs or professional learning communities where they can take advantage of coaching and mentoring. You also want to train your teachers to use the open education resources and that World Bank list is an example of open educational resources. Teachers should learn how to use a learning management system like Google Classroom 
to keep up with the progress of their student learners. They should be trained on how to adapt existing content to a blended format using, for example, the SAMR model. And finally, teachers should be learned, should be um, trained to use uh, platforms like Zoom and Skype and Google Groups and Adobe Connect, just to mention a few. Now, when we talk about student engagement, students really want control over what they learn, when they learn it, where they learn it, and how they learn it. Because successful blended learning implementation is predicated on student engagement. As the instructional guide on the side, you must help students understand that they have control over their learning and you must help them build the skills necessary to succeed. And this is done by setting clear behavioral and learning objectives, timelines and schedules. You want to help students improve their computer and digital literacy skills. You have to ensure adequate working technology. You must be able to differentiate and personalize instruction. We have to move from exam-based assessment to project-based learning. We can use gamification. We can create opportunities for students to collaborate and do some peer-to-peer -peer coaching. And if possible, we want to use all the available tools at our disposal for mobile learning, like BrainPop and Khan Academy, which I think you already use. You want to use educational animation. And if possible, you want to have virtual office hours so that students can have contact with you outside of class if it permits. So now, let's take a look at uh, this particular uh, example for student engagement. We know that student engagement increases when the content is fun, exciting, and relevant. Let, let's look at this example by Ubongo, which is also listed on the World Bank's list, Africa's leading children's entertainment and media company that reaches millions of children and their families. Their programs improve school readiness and learning outcomes for kids, and also promote social and behavioral change for kids, caregivers, and educators. I'm gonna show you about two or three minutes to save time, but when you're looking at this video, consider how it could be used to create, for example, a station rotation lesson on germs. Let's take a look. Akili has been playing all day long. Before going to bed, Akili and her baby brother need a bath. They need to wash with clean water, scrub with soap, and rinse with clean water to get really clean. Now they are clean and ready to get tucked into bed. Good night. Akili. Oh, hello, friends. Come on. Oh. Your friends seem to know what's going on. You better go with them, Akili. Shh. Be quiet. Whoa. What's that? Hmm. That is not a tree. It looks like a giant boot. And another one. Who is wearing those giant boots? Giant. It's a giant. No wonder Bush Baby is a little scared. He is huge. Mm, what is that on his hands? Oh, they are germs. Germs are tiny and make our body sick. But these are giant germs. They must have been hiding in the bathroom. Uh-oh. The giant is cooking with germs all over his hands. What did they get in the food? Okay, I had to stop that there, but it goes on to talk about the importance of soap and water and washing and so forth and so on. So it's a great lesson and something that can be used, for example, to put into a station rotation um, lesson plan. 
So now let's talk a little bit about parent engagement. You know your families and your students better than I do. But these are just some of the best practices that have been proved successful in other settings. But you will need to modify these to fit your circumstances. So we know that there is a, a connection between student outcomes and parental engagement. And some of the things that you can do would be to invite parents to school at the beginning of the year, schedule regular meetings and home visits, ask for their concerns and suggestions, invite them to follow their child through a typical school day, provide volunteer activities and opportunities, encourage participation in PTA meetings and other school events, ask them to engage actively in homework completion, and this is a good one, build parental computer and digital literacy capacity so that they can work with their students in that way. And also the virtual office hours. Assessment is always a big one that people ask me about. And it's important to assess every aspect of the blended learning program, not just student outcomes. You should assess the students, the classroom, the teacher, the school, and the district. Now, here are some assessment tools and methods that you can use to determine the efficacy of your blended learning program implementation. Some of these are familiar to you and others are not. So some are pre and post quizzes, which I'm sure you already do, teacher observations, weekly evaluations, frequent faculty meetings, for example, portfolios of uh, experience and continuous formative assessments among the others listed. And please forgive me for moving quickly, but I wanna get through the content before I run out of time. A rubric is an evaluation tool or set of guidelines used to promote the consistent application of learning expectations, objectives, and learning standards in the classroom, or to measure their attainment against a consistent set of criteria. Simply stated, it's just an evaluation tool to evaluate the same characteristics the same way every time. Here is an example of a blended learning uh, rubric. So, it, and you could do a SWOT for each one of these domains. You wanna think about what you're doing well, what's not working so well, what's missing, and what you can do to improve. And these are some of the domains that you can evaluate your blended learning program. Um, but you can add to these, like I would add professional development, and I would also add blended learning readiness to this blended learning rubric. Data infrastructure is a very important one. And we must ensure that teachers, students, and parents have access to digital devices and platforms by closing the digital divide. And so we do that by making sure, for example, there's high speed connectivity to schools, that you adhere to data privacy and security measures, that there's high speed Wi-Fi throughout the school, high quality, low cost devices, home internet access, digital citizenship and responsible use, and quality digital content and resources. And this is all surrounded by the, the, the core. It, it, the core is surrounded by these aspects. And the core is good leadership, good teaching, and good assessment. Finally, I had to take a sip of my water. It's important to solicit community partners to invest in education. Look, never underestimate the power of asking, right? You should have an elevator speech ready, like talk to your partners or the people you're soliciting, why they need to help you, why it's important and what they're going to gain from it. If it takes a village to raise a child, then ask for help from the villagers. Emphasize that we are training tomorrow's employees and ask for monetary support and in-kind donations. And I just listed some of the partners in Ghana that you might want to solicit help from, like MTN for digital capacity, and Bell Aqua for some dollars, and other individuals and other IT companies that may be able to provide some in-kind donations to you or some monetary support. 
Finally, let's talk about the future of teaching and learning. Right now, we're in the fifth industrial uh, revolution, and we are building the workforce for the 21st century. Therefore, we must teach 21st century skills. So the 21st educational needs and expectations include, but are not limited to the following list. First, we want to make sure that there is a permanent change in instructional methodology and pedagogy. We can't do the same thing that we've always done the same way. It's just not going to work. We have to resolve the digital divide. We have to understand that blended and online learning is no longer an option, but it is going to be the norm. We have to learn how to individualize and personalize instruction because we know students don't learn the same way at the same time. And we have to be ready for that. There are varied modes of learning that we need to take advantage of. We need to transition from exam-based evaluation systems that encourage memorization to project and task-based assessment. Textbooks will no longer be the source of information. We're going to have to teach our students to work collaboratively because that's going to be a fundamental element of education. And I know the last job that I retired from, collaboration was a fundamental piece of how we did our work. Teacher engagement will definitely increase with the use of online tools such as discussion boards and video conferencing and instant messaging and virtual reality, games and simulations and artificial intelligence. And there's gonna be increased parental involvement. There's no way around that. We've got to involve our parents in our children's education. So my final thoughts are these, very simple. Blended learning is here to stay, so we must be prepared. So thank you so much for your attention. I apologize for the technical difficulties, and I am here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Gwen, for that wonderful presentation. I am tempted to ask my audience to give you a standing ovation for that presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe that the audience have really enjoyed the session. Um, unfortunately, our time is running out, but then we'll take just one or two questions, and then you will speak to them. And then I'm sure you are going to be on the session, and then you can spend some time to answer the questions in the chat session. Great. So, Absolutely. Great. Um, let me just pick one of your points on students' control over what they learn. You made a point mm -hmm. that students love to control what they learn as against why they learn and what they learn. My question to that point is that how much should we give students as far as learning is concerned? How much content we should, should we give... make available to them? Yeah, we, every student is different. So we have to take it student by student. Some students are much more capable of controlling their learning than others. So you have to know your students, for example. Some students learn quickly, some students are not so quick. So you have to determine how much control a student is really capable of having. And they will let you know. They will let you know, you know, this is too babyish for me. I need to be able to move forward so you can accommodate that student's abilities. On the other hand, some students need constant supervision in order to complete the task. So you will make that determination on an individual basis. But I would say give them as much control as they can handle. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that brings me to maybe my last and final question. But before that, um, there's going to be a poll launched on the screens from the team. So kindly take some time to respond to the polls on the Zoom call. That is all our participants on the call. But then my last question, um, still talking about how much you give students as far as educational materials are concerned. 
Um, there is this one school of thought that says that if you are differentiating instruction, then you, you should as well differentiate assessment. However, the conversation gets a bit difficult when we have to talk about the fact that when students are sitting for national examination or national assessment, they are all going to be assessed on one scale. So in preparing students for national assessment, why should we give them differentiated assessment and then when it's time for them to take national exams, they would then have to take a uniform exam. What's your position on that argument? Well, in the classroom, you want to use a variety of assessments, but I'm not saying that in the classroom you should definitely exclude exam-based assessment. That should be a part of the classroom assessment because they need to have practice and experience at taking those kinds of assessments. But within the classroom, you should vary the assessments because let's face it, due to, for example, test anxiety, some students know the content, but when they see it on the test, they freeze and they can't think about it. They can't think of what the answers are. So prepare them to be able to do both. Use exam-based tests in the classroom that are similar to the national tests that they're going to take, but also use differentiated assessment so that you can really see how much a student knows or how much they don't know and what gaps you need to address in terms of their learning and how they were able to meet the objectives set forth in the course content. Fantastic. That's, that's very awesome. Thank you for your brilliant explanation on that subject.